Irene. Thank you for joining me today. Oh, hi, Dawn. I'm so happy to be here speaking with you. As the head of communications for Khan Academy, you really are shaping the future of education. And that really means that you are um, making a huge impact on all of us, our families, our communities, and the world. And I would love to just hear a little bit about you. Clearly, education is a passion point for you. Um, it started early, early on. You know, where did that come from? Yeah, um, it really came from my parents. My parents immigrated to the United States from Taiwan. Um, education was what got them over here and they wanted to make sure that my brother and I just had a strong education. So that was what they could give to us. And ever since then, I wanted to give back. There was a particular report, you know, three or four decades ago, it was called A Nation at Risk, put out by the Carnegie Foundation, talking about how our education system was really failing our kids, um, that it was good, but really not good enough, right? And so ever since then, I've had just this passion about how do you do it, not just for my kid or your kid, but for everybody's kids. How do we do How do we make education be great for all, all kids? Which really brings you full circle to Khan Academy because that's what's so striking to me is that the mission and the values of Khan Academy are so clear. You know, how do we provide free world-class education for anyone everywhere, every student, every classroom? And so I can imagine that clarity and mission is really freeing. At the same time, how do you stay authentic to who you are and what you stand for? Yeah, no, that is a is a great question. Um, I think one of the joys of working at Khan Academy is really getting to work under our founder, Saul Khan. You know, at first, when I first joined, I thought, oh my gosh, am I going to be intimidated by talking to this guy who's been on TED Talks and right. just inspired millions? But Sal is really, he's hes authentic, he's humble, and he is willing to show vulnerability and be very approachable. So I think, I think that one of the things I see Khan Academy doing well is building authentic relationships. And that starts, that starts with Sal. I think we, we, do, we have our values as many organizations, you know, you have your values. Some of ours are like, you know, live our users and live and breathe users. Um, we also like to be, you know, somewhat quirky um, and we want to fundamentally know each other. So one helpful thing that we do is we call donut time, which is um, we have we randomly match people up to meet one another throughout the month. So not only do you work with your team on work, but you just get to know people from wherever they are in the organization. I love that. And I think what, what I hear in a lot of the stories or reflections about how you work and how you are as an organization, that notion of always learning, which seems kind of obvious, but just so true, right? That you have to be able to make mistakes to be vulnerable, to get where you need to be, which is inherently built into learning in an essence, has to be the way you operate too. So we have this idea of, we wanna foster growth mindset in our students, which is this idea that you can learn anything. And that is literally the theme of our talent show. And so our talent show isn't just all about what are the amazing things you can do, but we like to see people's hobbies. But we have had people who said, I just started to learn this instrument four months ago, and I'm going to play for you what I've learned in the last four months, right? Because we really try to create this safe space where people can kind of share out what they do. And then they just get so much support and encouragement. And we just love that. that that's, a, that's a highlight. That's a takeaway for anyone, including us. I, I love the idea of a talent show with the idea of like having a mindset of a learning mindset and a talent show being the quintessential example of that. So if you can have the bravery to do it and the vulnerability in terms of the, the culture, there you go. Yeah. And, you know, we, we yeah, we so we just set those examples. So it's when employees and leadership, they were willing to expose themselves a little bit. Then okay. everybody else knows, oh, I can do that, too. When I was talking to you a few weeks back, you you referenced this question that really has stuck with me um, through the process of when you're in that moment of a lot of things whizzing around with you 
what is the importance of a clarifying question? And I thought, oh, yeah, that's my, I, what is my clarifying question that I can just always come back to center on? But there's probably so many related things that can impact that question, but you got to go right back to center on answering that question to stay true to your, your core. Yeah, educators call that, what's your guiding question? Yeah, so, so there yeah. is an educational vent to that. That's, that's right. where it comes from, its origin itself. So as a communicator then, Irene, and navigating through all of that, lots of things coming at you. Did your role change during that, that year's time? Or, or were there things different in the way that you had to show up for the team as the, the head of communications? Yeah, that's a good question. We, um, here's how the role did change. Um, at the outset of the crisis, um, my role, which is focused on external and internal communications, actually took on a cross-functional project management role. So just across all of marketing and sometimes you know, engineering and content, how do we just deliver resources for people? Um, and that was in the first three months. Internal communication, obviously so much more important. How do you have your executives show up authentic, reassuring, your jobs are going to be okay. Take the time off that you need for your family, right? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, here, here's a question for you, Irene. I um, am in Irene's class today for at Khan Academy. It's a get ready for what's ahead for communicators. What's your advice to everybody out there? It's about how do we kind of bring our crystal ball and mm -hmm. look ahead um, just a little. And I think we want to think about what did we learn from this past year, right? You know, what, what were... We learned that it was really important to, of course, stay agile, um, really, um, and that really keep your pulse with your employees. Um, so that's like frequent, frequent feedback from your employees to kind of um, stay on the pulse. And on the media side and on the PR side, it, it just continues to be what is the problem that journalists are trying to uncover and how can you give them solutions? The idea that, that your mission is somewhat unending can be so inspiring, but overwhelming at times too. You know, where do you start and end? How do you keep that prioritization happening in, in the right ways um, is also so critical. Then, and then that I think is like where leadership and management comes in, right? Yeah. And that's where you get down to brass tacks and say, okay, people in the next three years, this is what we can do. And so we're gonna advance our district and classrooms work. Um, we can create better science content. Um, our marketing efforts will focus on reaching to historically under-resourced learners. So every function breaks it down to what can we accomplish in the next 12 months. And we can't, you can't do it all. How do you get at those communities that may not have the access um, that they need? The reason, we, and that is why we're doing our district works. For, yeah. So for the first eight years of Khan Academy's life, we had people just come to our website, come to our app. To reach the students who need us most, now we're working with school districts so we can go to them. So Stu the districts we partner with, 70% of the students qualify for free and reduced lunch. Um, we give them an offering so that they can use Khan Academy in the classroom. That's living your purpose, Irene. That is really how you keep that in action, which is it started one way and providing your service in, in, in one dimension and then being able to really reach out beyond a screen and, and really have that impact is huge. It's really inspiring at the end of the day. I just um, love hearing about it. And I think there's a lot we can all learn from the way that you have um, really moved through your mission. I would love to hear from you. What is the favorite book over the last year or a book you're reading right now? Oh, I'm reading David Brooks' Second Mountain. I love David Brooks as an author and as a columnist, you know, at the New York Times. We may not see eye to eye on everything, but that's precisely why I read him. And I oh, also I think that. that he has such a fascination with um, people's life journeys. And Second Mountain is all about moral character. And he is very much willing to share how he's evolved his view.
Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Irene. It's been a great, great conversation. We, we covered a lot of territory and I, I do just appreciate you and you and your, your perspectives. Sure, thank you very much. Thanks, Don. This is so fun.